Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. This week on the podcast, my guest is Dr. Chris Jones. Now, who is Dr. Chris Jones? Well, I'm glad you asked. Dr. Jones has been an educator in Massachusetts for 22 years. His experience in the classroom ranged from 8th grade through 11th grade working in an urban setting. He is currently the principal of Whitman Hanson Regional High School in Whitman, Massachusetts. He's the author of Seeing to Lead, a book that provides strategies for how modern leaders can and must support, engage, and empower their teachers to elevate student success. Chris is also the host of the Seeing to Lead podcast. He is a finalist for the Massachusetts School Administrators Association Principal of the Year Award and was named the 2022 Massachusetts School Counselors Association Administrator of the Year. I can't wait for you to hear this conversation. Chris and I talked a lot about school culture, something we're both very passionate about, and we'll get to it right on the other side of this. Leaders, your educators deserve to have a leader who believes in them, who supports them, and who lifts them up when they're down. Right now, they deserve that reminder that they are traveling their own road to awesome. On that road to awesome, we focus on the things we can control and we let go of the things we can't. On that road to awesome, we rise by lifting others, not by pushing each other down. And on that road to awesome, we change the world one conversation at a time. Leaders, I want to work with your schools. I want to work with you and your educators to lift them up, to honor the work they do, and to let them know they are not in this alone. Let's get together. Let's have a conversation. Let's get your teachers back on that road to awesome, to find that love, to find that clarity, and to walk in their purpose. Reach out to us at roadtoawesome.net for your opportunity to bring Road to Awesome to your school. Now let's get on with that conversation with Dr. Chris Jones. I know you'll enjoy it. I'll see you on the other side. All right, Chris, thank you so much for joining me here on the Leaning into Leadership podcast. Um, I know this is going to be a great conversation, and I don't want to waste any time getting into it. So real quick, man, just tell everybody who you are so we can start talking about the good stuff. Sure, I'm excited too. Thanks for thanks for having me on. I'm I'm Chris Jones. Um, as you heard, I am currently a principal at Whitman Hanson Regional High School, and that is um, in Hanson, Mass, which a lot of people won't realize. So it's probably about 40 minutes southeast of Boston, um, over in Massachusetts. And uh, I've been here. This is going into my fifth year here, but I've been in education for 22 years. Uh, it's my second career. And uh, I've been loving every minute of it. And, you know, as, as you and I spoke before, um, it, I, I believe being a principal is the toughest job you'll ever love. And so uh, I just, that's, that's me. That's my, that's my background and who I am. I love it so very much. So uh, second career, what was the first career? I was a coppersmith before I got into education. Um, I, you know, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't care for school too much going through high school. And uh, I picked the college. The way I picked my college that I went to originally was by whoever paid me the most money to play football for. Him. And um, I just, I, I was kind of a late bloomer, I guess, as I got to get out in that. And then when I got out of school, um, I just really wasn't in on the education thing. Um, and I had a lot of, I had a lot of family members and friends saying, oh, "You should teach. You should teach." And I was, I was giving them tours at like Civil War battlefields and and things like that and i always told my mother we still joke about it to this day i told my mother i say hey look mom um i went to high school and i'll teach anybody anything but if you think i'm going to sit there and do classroom management for 90 percent of the time you're, you're crazy and uh i have i have no interest in that and i went i went to school in a um inner city um urban setting in high school and so i i Went to, I went back, they, they finally convinced me, I did my, my, you know, all the teaching stuff, the observations, things like that. And I landed my first job and, you know, as you're excited when you land your first job, I called my mother to tell her who'd been so supportive the whole time. And I said, Mom, 
guess what? I, I got my job as a teacher. And she's like, that's fantastic, Chris. Where are you teaching? I said, at an alternative high school. <laughs> and so uh, that was my, and she was like, really? And the, the guy that didn't want to do discipline um, or classroom management all the time. And I just never looked back from there. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And, um, but, you know, then I decided to leave the coppersmith piece and, and go into education full time. But I, I loved being a coppersmith working with my hands. And that's kind of passed down to my my two boys who are in similar fields or or looking to go into similar fields, I should say. That's that's just awesome. You know, I were talking earlier about, you know, kind of the origin story piece. And, you know, so often I think people lose sight of the fact, you know, I mean, we could teach right next door to somebody or work in the same building as somebody and have no idea how they actually got into education. Um, and I, I would have never guessed Coppersmith. I, I really would not have. So um, that's uh, that's a great story. I'm, I'm really glad you shared that. And, and before I go away from it, I just have to ask, since you're, since you're that close, are you a Patriots fan? Are you a fan of someone else? Or do you even care about football. Co- uh, professional football? Uh, no, I, I care about professional football, but I am not a Patriots fan, and it drives my staff crazy, except for about two of them who are the same team. I am a Steelers fan. And I, I have been for the longest time. Oh, that might be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I can't win. I'm, I'm just kidding. Right. I'm just no, kidding. No, and, well, no it's all good. It's all good. I don't really, I don't really care about baseball, but I'm, I, I also have the other cardinal sin under my belt because um, I, I'm originally, well, I'm originally from Oregon, but then I lived in Connecticut for a while, and um, I'm a Yankees fan. And boy, if there's something that's worse than being a Pittsburgh Steelers fan just south of Boston, uh, I don't, I don't go wearing a Yankees hat or anything. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. So, so I, you know, I'm a Rocky Mountain kid. So, yeah, I mean, I grew up. I mean, from the time I was a little kid, I've been a Bronco fan, and I will always be a Bronco fan. And um, don't really care for the Steelers. I don't really have a hatred for the Steelers. I really can't stand the Patriots. But um, I'm not worried about the Patriots this year. They're not going to be any good. So, so that's fine. You know, it's the whole. It's all about the AFC West this year, I think. But uh, and, and then I don't know. My team might finish last in the AFC West and be one of the best teams in the game. And it's going to be pretty crazy so we're not here to talk about football although we could uh there's no question about that but um, i want to go back to something you said just a couple of minutes ago and, and that's uh, that you started your education career at an alternative school so the guy who didn't want to do discipline didn't want to worry about classroom management um now most people i think would assume oh you go into an alternative school it's nothing but you know you know terrible behaviors and blah 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 which is usually contrary to that it's usually not that what were some of the lessons you learned that, that you've carried forward even to this day as a high school principal from working with alternative students? That is a phenomenal question that I don't think I've ever been asked before. Um, a lesson I carried forward from that is that, okay, there, there are a couple, right? So there's um, every kid is an individual and every kid has their own story that we don't understand unless we work to understand it. And the other one is that people learn in different ways and it's not time bound and without sounding too cliche, it's learning's not time bound. It's not necessarily context bound or situation bound, but everybody is interested in learning. If that curiosity is, is stoked like a fire. If, if you work to engage students on their level, meet them where they are um, and then don't keep them there. Don't expect them to be there, but set higher expectations to pull them out of that they'll get there because everybody really wants to learn and everybody's got a story. And if we ignore that or try to fit everybody in a box, that's where we, that's where we have our issues, our behavior issues and, and so forth. It's funny when I, when I was teaching at that alternative high school, um, a, a really funny story about that is uh, I had, I had a couple discipline incidents in the beginning of the year, but then as I really kind of got into my groove and started doing some things different, um, the year ended up well. And the following year, I was teaching some other courses and a kid signed up and he was in the hallway and he goes, hey, Mr. Jones, um, I, I've got you this year. And I said, really, what class do you have me for? He goes, oh, I got you for the American Civil War. And I was like, oh, cool. He goes, I don't know what it's about, but I got you for a teacher. And he was all happy about it. And I just, I just laughed because I gave them a chance to be who they were and met them where they were. A little context clue there, right? You know, I don't know what the class is about, but, you know. Maybe right. the American Civil War. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I just got to love that with kids, you know. I, I always felt this, you know, I, I know 
you and I talked about this when I was on your podcast about being a middle school teacher. Um, and, and I think with, with alternative school kids and, and honestly with a lot of high school kids too, um, if, if they buy into you, you know, if there's an authentic relationship there, they're going to work hard for you. Even, even if they don't even know what the subject is about, you know, right, um, right. they're, they're going to buy in and they're going to, they're going to really want to, to please you and, and to work hard for you. And that, that's a really interesting takeaway from, from working in an alternative setting. You know, so often it's, it's the idea of them believing in themselves. And, you know, it, if you, especially in an alternative school, but this, this reaches out into um, just your everyday, typical public high school, religious school, charter school, whatever. But if they, if they get into an area or a situation where they don't necessarily fit, they start to not believe in themselves or believe in their abilities as much. And then it just becomes a downward spiral, right? That voice in their head gets louder and louder. Okay, maybe I'm not that smart. Maybe I'm not as smart as the kid over on the other side of the room. Um, maybe I just can't do math. There's a general one that everybody says, I'm just not good at it. Oh, yeah. Um, and they, they start to fall behind, and then that gap widens. And the same is true for teachers. Um, you know, when, when teachers are teaching and they struggle for a day, then they struggle for a second day. Well, geez, maybe I'm not good at classroom management. Maybe I'm not good at engaging kids. And that voice gets louder and louder, and then they oftentimes take opposite approaches because their, their vision gets narrower and narrower. So instead of broadening their vision and thinking of doing something different, they kind of dig in and go back to what maybe used to work years ago for other people, but not necessarily in their context because they're not meeting the students where they're at. And that, that goes for principals too. Um, leaders need to meet teachers where they're at and make sure that they're broadening their vision as to what the teacher's going through. That is super powerful what you just said there. Um, I want to try to unpack all of it. Um, and where I want to go first, I think, is with the, the element with teachers and, and getting that self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, in their head. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Teachers make probably 10,000 decisions a day, and maybe four of them will be less than stellar, right? And they will beat themselves about the head and shoulders. I mean, we did it too, right? About the four, not about the, you know, the 9,996 great decisions we made, but the four we that didn't go necessarily well. Um, that, that ties in perfectly with, you know, that self-fulfilling prophecy around classroom management. You know, let, let's be straight. You know, we're, we're working with kids, we're working with human beings, and we're going to make mistakes. How do you coach your students? your staff through that how do you help them get out of that deficit mindset of you know i'm just not a good classroom manager or i just can't connect with this type of student and move them forward because i know you do yeah i you know it's it's the idea of you can't you can't ignore things that don't work well i mean we'd love to say we can ignore them but you definitely don't put them in the forefront so when i have a teacher doing that I try to turn their focus towards the positive and notice all the things they're doing. And one of the ways I do that is when I'm giving feedback, I depersonalize the things that are less than, so to speak, for lack of a better term. So something that didn't work or the decision worked out poorly or the outcome was poor, I depersonalize that when I'm giving feedback. And when something goes right, I make sure I personalize it because then if they get that feedback, that positive feedback, and that's personalized, they own that as part of, hey, yeah, he's saying that about me. And that's what I'm doing good. And if I depersonalize the negative, they say, well, it's not necessarily me so much. It's just that situation. And so there are different ways I can approach it because he said all these things that are good about me. And so I'm doing all these good things. I just need to shore up some of these things that aren't a reflection on me but just something that requires a different approach. That is, I love that so much. And it, it made me think about, this actually spins it now back to the students. Um, had the opportunity, somebody I've known for quite some time, a Dr. Keith Bell, who is a professor at the Ohio State University, pains me to say that, I'm not an OSU guy. Um, but, uh, but, but Dr. Bell uh, is at the Ohio State University. And, um, I, li I listened to him speak this summer, and one of the things that he spoke about was how to work with a child and depersonalizing the behavior from 
them as the individual. And I mean, he actually modeled how he would do it when he was, you know, a high school, he was also a high school principal, um, and how he would have two chairs, um, across from another chair when he would sit in and do discipline with students and would put like a backpack or something in that other chair and talk to the backpack when he was speaking about the behaviors and speak to the student when he was speaking about everything else and, and make sure they understood. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the behavior. That behavior isn't you. Um, it, the more we can do to depersonalize, I just love how you, how you talked about that because our teachers are human beings too. And they want to please their principals. I mean, some of them want to act tough and, and act like, no, I don't want to please my principal. But come on, they do. Um, you know, I mean, if, if you're building the type of culture that I know you are, and we're going to talk about culture in a minute, they want to please you. And so I just kudos to you on on that element, folks. That's a that is a huge leadership gold nugget that Chris just dropped right there. Make sure you catch that that depersonalizing the. Uh, the behavior, the, the the attribute that wasn't strong from the individual is just, that's key. Um, I'll, I'll give you a second to just kind of react on that a little bit too, maybe go a little further. Yeah, no, it's because nobody, look, nobody gets up and comes to work in the morning to do a bad job. But as soon as somebody's telling them that an outcome is because of them, you get defensive. And so when we're defensive, we clam up and we're not really going to be able to honestly or authentically look at or reflect on what we've done or the outcome that we've gotten, how that can change to get a better outcome. Everybody wants a better outcome and, and everybody, it's funny you said everybody wants to, you know, teachers want to please their principal like kids want to please their parents um, and students want to please teachers, but it's everybody likes a pat on the back. Now, I mean, you can go into love languages and things like that and how they like to get that pat on the back, but everybody, there's... <laughs> You can't convince me there is a person walking the face of this earth that does not walk a little taller, um, pick their chin up a little more when they get a compliment saying that they've done a good job or that it's been noticed that they did something well. Uh, they're, they're, that's just not the case. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, that's um, this will lead us perfectly into a conversation about culture. And that was one of our primary strategies moving from a culture of catching them doing it wrong to a culture of catching them doing it right. I mean, that, that's honestly what PBIS is all about. You know, you recognize, reward, and reinforce the behaviors you want to see. You start to see more of those types of behaviors. And, I mean, you're absolutely right. No, nobody gets out of bed in the morning. And, um, you know, I used to joke about this, but, you know, nobody's looking in the mirror thinking, hey, which kid can I screw over today? Right. No teacher is doing that. You know, but unfortunately, sometimes they get into school and, you know, and maybe maybe they didn't, you know, maybe they didn't check the attitude well enough in the car on the way in or I don't know, maybe they had a tough day with their kid or they spilled coffee on themselves. I mean, good no, goodness knows we've all, we've all been there. But then that's when when the adult behaviors happen and it's your job and my job to step in and just say, hey, you know, let's separate that from you. That's not you. That's just something that happened. It's an event. It's not you as the person. I just love that so much. So, so, so let's dig in a little bit more on culture. Um, yep. let, let's let's really go there. Um, I know you have a new book out, and, and definitely culture is a big piece of that. Talk to me a little bit about what you prioritize or what you're really looking for. The work you're doing intentionally to build and maintain the culture you want to see in your school. I'm intentionally making sure that. I hit all the three areas that I talk about in my book. I'm, I'm intentionally putting into place practices that actively and really out in the open support teachers, um, practices that engage teachers, and then I empower teachers to go do their own thing. I, I want a bunch of risk takers. Now, obviously, safe risk takers, but I want a bunch of instructional risk takers in the classroom. Um, and they know that. Teachers know that. So. When I'm when I'm looking at support, I'm in I'm in classrooms and you and you hear this a lot, but it doesn't always happen for people. I'm in classrooms all the time. And when I go into classrooms, um, I make sure I personally I use Voxer as a way of giving feedback. But you want to make sure you get feedback to them right away. And what I do, again, is with that personalization of success, the depersonalization of where they need to improve. I do that really quick through some feedback. And I make sure that I model pathways to success for them. 
and I do that through coaching. So if there's something that needs to be improved, it's it's all about building goals or setting goals and then building backwards from the goal and looking at uh, looking at your indicators along the way, lead indicators instead of lag indicators. You can't just set a goal and say, I'm going to get better at, let's just pick, I'm going to get better at transitions and say, okay, I'm going to improve transitions in a month and month goes by and you hope to improve transitions and you look after a month and you're not done and you get a yes or no, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. No, instead, what you need to do is check in along the way and say, I want to improve my transitions because I want them to be tighter. So I want to make sure that my what are now minute and a half transitions because kids are talking to 30 second transitions in two weeks. And I'm going to do that because I'm going to work with the kids and in, inform them that, you know, they shouldn't be stopping to talk to their friends or however you do it. I'm just throwing some things out there, but you want to check it along the way. And I work with the teacher to do that. Now, that's the part of support that I'm talking about building a map. And when you support a teacher, you have to notice where they're where they need to improve or areas they need to improve in that they also agree they need to improve in and then you both have to sit build a map on how to get there and then you monitor that now the key to that is there are going to be times where that doesn't work right things come up hardships happen um, obstacles get in the way that's when myself as a leader i need to be the one that builds the bridge for them So whatever obstacle gets in their way, I need to make sure that if it's an obstacle, I have the ability to get, uh, and I'll explain this a little more in depth, if I have the the ability to get that obstacle out of the way, I do that so that they can continue moving towards improvement and they don't get derailed. That's not to say I'm not, and this is a phrase we've been, people have been using for parents recently is a snowplow parent. I don't, I don't (laughs) prepare I don't prepare the road for the teacher to improve. I prepare the teacher to improve along the road. But sometimes we have obstacles in public schools. You know this as well as I do, or as well as a lot of your listeners do, that really don't need to be there and that the leader has the ability to get rid of, be it financial, be it time bound, be it structure, something like that. And that's really where I need to jump in. Otherwise, they need to because then they buy into it and then they're empowered to create their own goals and achieve their own success. I think that's outstanding. Um, I, I want to go back to something you just said in there. Um, and I, I know you were using transitions as just an example, but within that, you talked about the teacher talking to the students about what their goal is. Um, first off, very, very powerful strategy. Second, not very often is that used. I think the more conversations we have with our kids, the more honest and open and vulnerable we are with our kids, the more likely we are to see success in those steps. Is that something that has happened organically in your school or is that something you've had to coach? Is it a little bit of both um, where we're getting the kids involved in that? Again, that builds ownership. But how is that working at your school? What are what are some steps that that my listeners can learn from you about how to make that happen? Sure, it's a it's a little bit of both, right? And and you have that in any in any staff or faculty. You're going to have some that are already down that path, and you're going to have some that would never even think of doing that. So it's modeling is what it comes down to, and I know that modeling is used so often. I do that in faculty meetings. Um, my faculty meetings look a little different. We, we set them up different, but I model the idea that, look, if I'm going to talk about continuous improvement, everyone knows I need to continuously improve. So I'm very open and honest about the goals that I set and where I'm struggling and where I'm improving. And I do that in a variety of ways. I do that through faculty meetings. I do that through my weekly internal memo. And I do that through videos that I post each week. But then I'll work with teachers and if teachers are saying they're struggling with this or I'll see that teachers are struggling with this, I'll ask them when they're struggling with it, I'll, I'll try and relate to it with myself. And then if they tell me they're having problems with students, I'll say, well, okay, are you doing that relating with your students? Um, and that's not necessarily building a relationship. Those are incredibly important, but you need to let the students see that you set goals, that you fall short and you keep going and you're a teacher because that provides them a glimpse into what could be and a glimpse into, you know what, I didn't get this math problem because we used math earlier. 
I didn't get this math problem, not because I'm not good at math, I just didn't get it yet. And so I've set a goal that I need to get to a certain mastery level. I just haven't gotten there yet, but that's okay because, you know, uh, Dr. Jones, he tried his thing and, and he failed. And look where he's gone. He's he's done all right and he's succeeded. So it's it's a lot of modeling about that whole talking back and forth. You know what it is? I, I guess the best way to explain it is it's authentic. We're people. You know, people talk about, um, I think it was N NAA or N NASSP that um, put out the 360 review. And I know businesses yeah. do that and things like that. But how about just the idea of a 360 degree person or leader or teacher or student? Um, it's just being authentic and showing that you're a human being. It's not like they open the closet and you walk out of the closet fully dressed, ready to go teach a class. We will return to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast in just a moment. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, man, I should write a book? Well, if you have, then let me ask you another question. What's holding you back? What keeps you from taking the step that moves you from, I have an idea about a book, to, I am a published author? From experience, I would bet it's probably you're wondering who would even want to read a book that I wrote. Maybe you're questioning the idea. Is it unique enough? Is it valid enough? Is it good enough to be a book worthy of having published? Hey, as a best-selling author myself, I can tell you, most writers have had the exact same feelings at some point in time during their writing journey. Here at Road to Awesome, we believe in cultivating leaders by elevating voices and promoting positivity. And a part of that work is publishing books for educators by educators. Go to roadtoawesome.net and hit the Contact Us button to set up a free, no-obligation conversation about your book idea. Hey, educators, we've all had incredible experiences. We all have amazing stories, and every one of them deserves to be told. Go to roadtoawesome.net, hit the Contact Us button. Let's have that conversation about your book idea. And now, back to the Leaning into Leadership podcast. Let's dive in a little bit more into the book. Uh, I, I want to I make sure that we have the opportunity to really hit um, you, you've kind of kind of grazed over the top, but let's go a little bit deeper into that seeing to lead model and and really maybe talk about, you know, each of the elements that you're trying to help leaders understand uh, as you go through your book. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, the model is a circle and um, it's almost I pictured almost like a flywheel. So the the model of seeing C S E E support, engage and power is you start with support with teachers and then once you're supporting teachers and you're supporting them in the way where they're starting to feel good about their practice or better about their practice because let's not forget our high performing teachers need support just like our lowest performing teachers um, once you do that and get them get them the support they need then you get them engaged into the school culture and you get them engaged in the vision of the school you then they become empowered because they're engaged in what's going on in the why, which if I can stop on the engaged piece for a minute, the way you get people engaged in the overall vision of the school, because every school needs a vision and that vision needs to be created by everyone in the school and um, the community of the school. But what you do when you're doing that vision or when you have that vision is you, you focus on having everybody do their own personal why. So just for an example, and I, this example is in the book, something I do with my faculty is we broke into groups and everybody talked with each other about their why, why they got into education. And I, you know, I know people say, oh, we're going to talk about our why. It's so important that it often hides from us a little bit. So you have to get it, get it out through conversation. Once they talked about their why, I then had them share out about their individual whys and everybody could see, oh, that's why that person, that's why that person. And then I had them get into larger groups. I combined the groups and then those groups shared their whys again really quick, but then talked about themes that emerged among all their whys. So everybody has their why, but themes definitely emerge when you put a bunch of educators together. And then they shared the themes out that they had. Then I combined the groups into some larger groups and it ended up being three larger groups. And 
I had them create a story that exemplified their why, that explained what, why they got into education using those themes that they found in their group and things. And then we shared those stories out. And that was such a powerful moment for a lot of people um, that then when we put the vision together, they all have a piece of that. A, they have their personal why is connected to the vision and they can see clearly how they're personally connected to the overall vision of the school. And so by doing that, they become very engaged in what the school's about and moving the school forward because it's part of them and they can see where they're connected to it. And then once they do that, then you move on to the empower piece. And the empower piece is people taking the initiative, doing what they what they believe to be right without having to ask me for everything and then me giving some things to people to do with the idea and here's the trick and this is why it's a, a flywheel the idea is that if you're empowering somebody properly they are going to run into issues they are going to fall short they're going to fall down they're going to stumble because they're they're stretching themselves and it's incredibly important that once you empower somebody you once they've done if it's a task once they've done that task and you're reflecting on it you don't harp on the negative you definitely don't ever say i would have done it this way but what you do is you focus on how good they've done with this stepping out and say so next time what we're going to do is we're going to adjust it this way you can maybe adjust it this way or what have you learned and have them reflect on it and then you support them you go right into a mode of support with them with that piece they've fallen short and then they they either remain engaged, they become engaged quicker, and then they're quicker to be empowered. And that wheel starts to that wheel starts to spin faster and faster. And you want to get that wheel spinning as fast as you can, because then a lot of them hover in the empower, and they stay engaged. Um, because it, the worst thing you can do is empower somebody and tell them, "Oh, I would have done it this way," or then not support them when they fall short, because boy, they're never going to step up again after that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely the truth. I'm just I'm just sitting here with a big smile on my face because it's taking me back to you know to my high school principal days and 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 being in those conversations with so many different staff members and you know seeing each of them kind of progress their own way and continue to to grow and continue to grow. What what are some strategies you're using right now? And I, I guess I, let me preface with this question. Um, Tell everybody real quick about your leadership team. Is it you and a couple of assistant principals? Do you have a lot of assistant principals? Do you have a, a counseling team? I mean, who is part of instructional coaches? Who's part of helping your teachers grow? Uh, I've got, so I've got myself, I've got an assistant principal, and I've got a dean of students. Um, we have about 1,100 students in the school. And then okay. I have, I have a, we call it a student support center um, because we broke down and made a larger suite of um, where our school counselors are, our adjustment counselors, and our school psychs so that there's no stigmatism about somebody having to go talk to somebody for mental health or anything like that. It's love one that. big suite. They go in and it's kind of serve while we call it our student support center. Um, I love and that. I've got my, I've got, um, it's, it's worked out really well. Um, I've got my director of student counseling as another person I consider my admin team. And those are really, those are the, the people I call the admin team. The larger leadership team, I also have some curriculum coordinators um, for your core courses. So, you know, history, English, science. And so we meet twice a month. We meet every other week to make sure that everything is is where it's got to be. Um, so it, you know, it's funny that you say that because as I'm thinking about it, that really allows me to take more of this approach with teachers where I go in um, and I can give them that quick feedback and they're not worried because it's not really evaluative and if, it, if there's something negative enough that needs to become evaluative then we can we can talk about that but they know they're being evaluated by their curriculum coordinator that I'll get in and do one evaluation and sign off on it um, or just review and sign off on it from what I've seen informally but it, it, it allows me to have those deeper conversations with people that's exactly where I was going with that question uh, was I was just really curious you know what what is the mechanism was the system that that allows for and empowers for that matter to that leadership team around you so you're not the only one doing this work um, there's 
I know there are a ton of principals that are out there. I know I struggled with it at first too, um, who think they have to do all of that on their own. And they're not willing to turn that over to an assistant principal. Or um, I, I love that you have, you know, curriculum leaders that are doing that. Or, you know, I think I, I added this department heads. Actually, actually, as a high school department head, I got to evaluate teachers. Um, it was really an interesting experience. It gave me, gave me a great opportunity to, to have a good idea of what that was going to look like going forward. But um, that's where I was really going with that was just yeah. really curious about, you know, you want that flywheel going and it's really hard to get that flywheel going on, you know, as many staff as you have with 1,100 kids all by yourself. It's got to be a shared lift was what, where I really wanted to go with that. Well, you know, it's interesting because, and just two real quick things about that is, um, and one of them is something you said, the whole delegation piece. Um, what is it about leaders that they're so slow to delegate? Um, delegation. <laughs> no takes, doubt. Right? <laughs> Delegation takes work, first of all. Delegation is not, um, and I think it's Danny Bauer that said this, delegation is not abdication. And so when you delegate, you have to show people how things, how to do things, um, just the framework, because then you empower them to go fill that in and do it the way that works best for them with the best result they can get. But you can't just throw something at somebody and say, hey, yeah, you're going to go do this. That doesn't work for delegation. That certainly doesn't work for empowerment. So, but once you do that, man, the, the results you can get are just absolutely fantastic. Um, and then the, and the next, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that's such a struggle, especially for early career leaders to, to, to be willing to, to let go of that. I'll be honest with you. I worked with some who had been leaders for much longer than I had, who still couldn't let go of that. Um, uh, go ahead, go with where you're going to go. I just, I, I know leaders struggle with that. Yeah, no, they do. And that's that's one of the reasons I, I was fine with you jumping in and saying something because I forget what the second one was. I got I got to thinking so much about the, the delegation piece that I, I forget what I was going to talk yeah. about um, for the second piece. But I'm sure we'll come back to it. That's fine. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's good because th that piece of the conversation was was definitely worth, uh, worth chasing there. Um, I, I guess, you know, that's kind of the... Where, where you hear the micromanager piece, you know, uh, you know, people want to just get in and just do too much and and not trust others. Um, and, and I think this is a big culture piece, too. Right. Um, if if we're not willing to trust those who we have around us on our leadership team, why are they there? You know, I mean, and maybe you didn't hire. Maybe you did. But but the bottom line is. You can't call yourself a team if you don't trust each other, and that starts with you as as the school leader. How, how do you make sure that trust exists? I mean, and, and then I'm going to ask you a dovetail question that you can tie together here. Do you have somebody new who's part of that team? Because because you know me, you know this as well as I do. I mean, heck, you you played you know college football. You get a new member of the team, you have a new team. So how do you do that? How do you make sure that you're building that trust continuously? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you talked about the trust piece um, because the piece, it made me remember what I forgot to say um, because it has to do with trust. Well, there you go. I do with, see, you planned that. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to say that that's what it was. <laughs> trust is, you know, trust is built from just being authentically you. Um, and one of the ways that I trust with my faculty is, one, I, I make sure that anything I ever tell them happens. So we do surveys and things like that, right? Everybody hates being surveyed. Everybody hates wasting time. I show them that their time is valuable to me and anything I ever do like on a survey or anything like that, they see in action. And I, I specifically point it out. So if I ask you, um, if I ask you what your favorite snack is, which is one of the surveys that questions I ask people, um, you, a snack shows up in your mailbox, one of your favorite snacks, just randomly to, you know, to show that I'm using that. Or if I survey something, I'll use it at the next faculty meeting and say, this comes from the survey that you filled out to show them that. One of the most important things about that is I allow my staff to evaluate me every year. So midway through the year, I hold, we call them 15 minute meetings. They usually go to about 20 minutes um, where I ask them three questions and I do it every year. Um, everybody on the staff comes in and answers, what am I doing that right now that I need to continue doing? What am I doing right now that I need to stop doing? 
In other words, what am I doing that's good for you? What am I doing that you don't like? And then what's something I can do for you right now to support you in what you're doing each day? And through those conversations, uh, I learn where to improve. And then obviously I take themes out of them, but I make sure that I do something visible that shows that I'm improving that. And then I make sure that I do take those things that people say they need for support and I do them. And I, I got to be honest with you, Darren, some of them, one, one time, one of them was, you know, I like to use magnetic poetry in my classroom and I've got one box and it's really hard. I would just love to have another box of magnetic poetry because I know, you know, it's a little tough. Man, I went out that night and ordered that teacher two boxes of magnetic poetry. You know what I mean? So it's anytime you can let teachers know that they're heard, let them know that they have a say and let them know that this is their building right after it's the student's building, but we could talk about that after, um, then that's going to build trust. When you show them that you are vulnerable, and I don't mean, you know, um, getting up there and saying, oh, well, I, I don't feel like I look good today and my outfit was bad. And I mean, when you show them you're vulnerable, that you're trying to improve and maybe you fell short, but this is what you're doing to get better. Or this is something that has had you frustrated with work for a little while and this is why. When you can model that for teachers, they begin to trust you because you're a human being, because you're authentic, because there is 360 degrees of you. Now, new members to the team, that's a really good question because when I came in, everybody was here and I still have everybody that was here when I came in as the new person, the odd personnel. So I made sure the first thing I did is I sat down, I had a really long meeting with my assistant principal about um, who I was, who I heard this person was and how I wanted to know who this person was instead of what I heard this person was. Um, and we outlined the type of relationship that we had or we're going to have. Um, our dean of students, he, he used to be part-time. He just came on full-time. So now he's more of a member of the team, but it's still new. He's still kind of trying to figure things out because roles have shifted a little. Well, we've been very vocal about that. And I make sure I meet with him regularly to make sure that he feels as if he's part of the team his decisions matter and that we're we're supporting what he does. Um, anytime you get a new member on the team, you have to honor who they are because you're not looking to bring people on your team. If you truly want to improve, you are not looking to bring people on your team that fit with your team. You're looking to bring people on your team that expand your team, that add to your team because of who they are as individuals, not because of who they want to be to fit in with you. I love that. That's that's that is really great leadership thinking. Uh, there's there's a lot to be said for um, making sure that you surround yourself with people who aren't like you, people who are going to help make you and your team better. That's that's absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, let's go ahead and dive into what is typically the last question. I'll I'll, I'll still have a, one more after that, but um, it's the leading into leadership podcast. So. Dr. Chris Jones, how are you leaning into leadership right now? I am leaning into leadership by revamping how we're doing things in our building. Um, over the past over the past year and a half, two years, everybody, every high school USA has taken a little bit of a culture hit just by virtue of in school, out of school, what rule applies now, what doesn't apply. Um, and so I've rededicated myself into the work of being a leader through modeling, through planning, through execution, through support and engaging people um, by revamping how we've opened this school year and different procedures we've put in place to address the idea of getting students back engaged into in-person learning, um, getting teachers to understand that being flexible doesn't mean giving away grades um, and that high expectations are good for everyone if you offer them the steps to get there. Um, and the idea of empowering everybody to own the culture of the building and to make sure that they're in a building and building a culture that they want to be part of and that they're proud to be part of instead of complaining about a culture that they wish they had. 
That is extremely well said right there. I love that. And, you know, that's a really important element, too. Um, and, again, more gold nuggets uh, being dropped here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. I, I see this across the country right now. I've talked to so many different schools and, and so many districts. And, and among the struggles they're seeing is exactly what you just said, especially in the high school level. Now that we've come back into full in-person Maybe some of our teachers have been, it's like they've been, you know, like the power went out and they've come back to their factory setting. And instead of where they were, now they're reverting back to, oh, well, you know, I'll punish their behavior with grades or, you know, those kinds of things. So, so super powerful. I love how you are rededicating yourself to making sure that the culture gets right back to where you want it to be and, and even go beyond that. So, uh, let's wrap up with this, Chris. Um, how do people get in touch with you? How do they get connected with you? How do they get a copy of your new book? Uh, I'm Dr. C.S. Jones just about everywhere, um, but I hang out on Twitter most. I do some Instagram, but I'm not very proficient at it, so I'm I'm looking for somebody to build me a map for that. But um, I uh, And I just started trying TikTok, I, I think. I should whisper that. Don't put that in the recording, maybe. I don't know. But um, no. <laughs> yeah, there's I, a learning um, curve there, too. Oh, yeah, there is. And um, but um, so Dr. C.S. Jones everywhere, my email, reach out to me on email and I'd be happy to get back to you. That is Dr. Chris S. J. at gmail.com. That's Dr. D.R. Um, C.H.R.I.S.S.J at gmail.com and to get my book you can um, go to the website seeing to lead.com which is the title of the book um, if you head over there you can easily pick one up off the website from me there sign copies bulk orders things like that um, and or you can pick it up on Amazon there you go and I'll put links for all that stuff folks in the show notes so you have an opportunity to click on all of Chris's social media links go buy a copy of the book shoot him an email, all that kind of stuff. Learn about everything, everything you didn't already learn about Dr. Chris Jones here on the Leading Into Leadership podcast. Chris, thanks so much for the time today. Really appreciate the conversation. This was an absolute blast. I hope you have a great rest of your year, man. Thank you very much, and I appreciate you having me on. Just a wonderful conversation with Dr. Chris Jones. I appreciate him being on the show. Um, you know, so many things that he talked about in there that were just incredible gold nuggets of leadership that, that I hope you were able to pick up. Two that really stood out to me, and one is just simply how he works to make sure that kids talk about goals just as much as we talk about goals with adults. Um, I loved how he mentioned the 360 degree person and looking at ourselves as a 360 degree person, not just looking for 360 degree feedback. Um, and I guess a bonus one too, just talking about how his faculty meetings just feel different. And here's the bottom line, folks. That's about building culture. That's recognizing, rewarding, and reinforcing the things that you want to see. Make sure you check out Chris's book. I linked that in the show notes for you. I also linked in the show notes his podcast, Seeing to Lead. Folks, it's fantastic. Make sure you check it out. And now it's time for a pep talk. Earlier this week, I had to stop at the grocery store and pick up a couple of things, including some fresh chicken breasts. So I ran to the meat counter and found some chicken breasts and I reached in and picked them up and I found that the package was kind of sticky. You know how sometimes the blood from the chicken will kind of leak out of the package? Uh, that's why they have those baggies there for you to put them in. Well, I reached up. There were no baggies. I looked at the counter to my left. No baggies. Uh, the entire meat department, I found one roll of baggies and that was almost out. I was really frustrated because now here I am with this sticky stuff on my hands and I don't want to touch anything. Remember not long ago when there were re uh, hand sanitizing stations everywhere you looked like every three feet? Yeah, none at all in this store on that particular day. All I could think was what has happened to customer service? What has happened? As a people, I think we've become accustomed to being let down. You know, poor service at a restaurant or slow service uh, at something else or like this particular experience for me at, at a grocery store. I love to really celebrate when I get great service. You know, I'm going to tip well. I'm going to make sure and say something to them about how great a job they did uh, with that particular service. But, but what it made me really think about, and I actually wrote a blog about it this week. It's linked in the podcast uh, show notes as well, um, was what if we made sure 
in our schools, we were delivering five-star service all the time. What if we were always going above and beyond? What if the experience that our parents, our business partners, our visitors, our kids, and our staff, what, what, if, what if the experience they have is absolute five-star top shelf all the time? Could it potentially change their perspective? Could it potentially change the way they show up every day? I think the answer is yes. What if we put our time and our effort into making sure that as schools, we bring five-star customer service? I think it's critical. I think it can be accomplished. We just have to be intentional. Just like with anything else in leadership, when we set our mind to it, we believe in it, and we commit to it, we can make it happen. Thanks for joining me this week on the podcast. I hope you have a road to awesome week. Thank you for listening to the Leaning into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.